like some of our folks uh, didn't turn their clocks back or forward. Because <laughs> if you're yeah, late, you're late. Well, the thing about it is your smartphone changes automatically. Right. Unless you don't have that. But our brains don't change automatically. No. Mine did. What? Mine did. Your smartphone didn't change? Oh, your brain. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Come to the Lord with openness, seeking God's presence wherever it brings you. Bring your doubt, bring your belief. Seek the Lord with all that you have within you. Welcome to this time of worship. Amen? Amen. It looks like maybe some of our friends are still sleeping, <laughs> that they didn't turn their clock uh, forward. I don't know, but uh, it is a great place to be here together with you in the warmth of this room on such a beautiful, beautiful morning. It truly is. Um, and good morning, Facebook friends. Uh, whoever is on right now, we're glad that you are with us, that you have joined us. Please make some comments in that comment thread. Let us know that you're there. And also let the church know how we can pray for you 
those things that you want to both share that's celebratory and those places that you maybe are hurting. Uh, we would like to hear from you and partner with you in those prayers. So again, it's good to be with all of us. Um, so yeah, last week up until 6 a.m. Sunday morning, I was determined I'm going to preach and then it just didn't happen. <laughs> so if you were here, you know, I was sitting over there and Angie preached and did such a beautiful, beautiful job, but um, had one of those bouts of bronchitis again. So I'm still getting my voice back, but I think I'm there. I think I'm just about there. So it's great to be here. Uh, we were supposed to start um, last week a sermon series called Encounters with Jesus. Uh, and so we start that today. And, and again, I'm very excited, very blessed um, to be uh, at that beginning um, of, of the journey, more toward the beginning than we are at the end. So uh, with that, if you will bow your head and let's give this time to the Lord. God of wilderness and nighttime, as we journey on in this season of Lent, Shaped by your Holy Spirit into the image of Christ our Lord, we ask that you help us to be ready. Give us, Lord, abundant grace to confront the power of death and darkness with the promise of your light in Jesus Christ. And we do ask all this in his name. Amen. Amen. So uh, a few things to share uh, this morning for sharing of our life. Today is what we call First Cup uh, here at the church. Uh, both Angie does First Cup for the table community, and she's doing that like right now, which is why she's not in worship. And then I have my First Cup uh, with whoever would like to join me for that immediately following this worship service. So if you have questions you want to know about the church, about your life of faith, about the United Methodist Church, what, whatever, whatever that looks like, how, how you live your life out at Blackwater United Methodist, or you, or you just want to discuss, you know, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Uh, just if you have time, if you have a little while, just hang out in this space after worship and we'll go grab a cup of coffee and share that and share some warm conversation. I would love to do that with anybody who would like to today. Um, we've started with the Easter lily orders, and you may have seen those envelopes both in the back and here as you enter or exit the church. So uh, you've got about three weeks, I believe, to put those orders in. Just make sure that your handwriting is clear and that you circle in memory or in honor of whoever that you're giving the lilies uh, for, because sometimes that creates uh, an undue burden um, to try to figure out how, how, how that's name is spelled. Uh, so please just write on there clearly, but you'll find those envelopes at both uh, exits today. Um, Peggy Duncan, our campus uh, custodian, many of you, if not all of you know Peggy, um, she uh, called me the other day and asked if she could have a garage sale here uh, to benefit her brother-in-law. Uh, he's got cancer. It's non-treatable, uh, can't be cured. He's just been dropped by his insurance and also was denied to get on the government Medicaid program. So she just wants to do what she can uh, to help. So um, uh, that is going to be on April the 2nd, but what she's really um, asking for all of us, and she's asking other places, her own church, her family, and everybody too, if you have items that you would donate to that, um, please do so. Um, you, we can figure out how that's going to look as far as drop off, but she's here every day of the week. So if you're here, talk to her about it. If not, call the church if you want more information and we'll put you in touch with Peggy. But I know that she will really, really appreciate that. Um, this Friday, uh, the barn on Blueberry Hill is the place to be. Friday, March the 18th at 11.30? 11, I'm looking at y'all, Kathy, Virgie, 11, 11, okay, 11 for an adult Easter egg hunt and, a, and a, what I know will be a beautiful lunch. And so all of you are invited, and if you uh, need directions for that, there's three people in the room today that can give you those directions. Raise your hands, they're all on the side. We've got, uh, oh, we've got four, Ben. We've got Kathy, Virgie, and in the back, um, Miss Brownie, Miss Sharon. So you can see any of those folks if you need directions. But I know it will be a just wonderful time of fellowship and good food and uh, maybe receiving that visit from the Easter Bunny. Two more things. And this is just, uh, you know, me and Angie were talking this week that today marks 
uh, two significant memories for us as a church. Uh, the first one is three years ago on this Sunday, the table launched. Three years. It doesn't seem possible. Uh, but yeah, three years ago. And so they're going to be celebrating their birthday next Sunday. So it's just exciting to continue to see that to grow and thrive and, and have uh, new families coming to be a part uh, of that service. And I, we should all be very thankful because we're all a part of that work. Um, the other thing is two years ago on this particular Sunday, it happened to be on March the 15th on that Sunday. Do you remember what happened? We shut the doors, right? So we did not have worship, and that lasted through almost the end of June. So I don't know about y'all, but does it feel like that was two years ago? Sometimes, sometimes I feel like it was yesterday, and other times I feel like it was just forever ago. And so it's just, you know, I, I, I say all that to just think about both the blessings that we go through together as well as the difficult uh, things that we share together. And yet the church is here, God is here, we are here, and, and let our hearts be filled with gratitude. I think that's really important for us to do. So now I'm going to ask uh, and invite you to stand as you are able and greet one another in the name of Jesus. Make sure you tell our Facebook friends good morning. Good morning, Facebook friends. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Good morning. <laughs> and now we're going to sing verses 1 and 2 of Lift High the Cross. And I believe that that will be on your screen. And now, if you will join me in our affirmation of faith, uh, specifically for the Lenten season. And again, that will be upon the screen. We believe that our lives are held within the encircling love of God. Our gracious Father, who knows our names and recognizes our deepest needs. We believe that Jesus is the divine child of the living God and that his grace is like living waters that can never be exhausted. We believe in his embodied love that died and rose for our sake. We believe in the birthing, renewing, enabling spirit of God who yearns over our welfare as a mother yearns for her child. We believe that God is in the arid desert as well as in green pastures and that hard times and discipline are also loving gifts. We believe that our journey has a purpose 
and a destination, and that it leads to a human glory we cannot yet imagine. We believe that in the church, we are fellow pilgrims on the road, called to love one another as God loves us. This is our faith, and we are humbled to profess it in Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. pray. <coughs> Holy and everlasting God, we come before you this day from so many different places, from warm beds, from hot cups of coffee in our hands. Lord, we come from perhaps having grand celebrations this weekend or maybe, Lord, we come from a place of feeling lonely and in need of company, in need of a warm touch and a loving voice. Lord, we know and we believe that you meet us here no matter where we have come from, both yesterday and the day before and the week before and the month before. Lord, we know that you are just overwhelmed with gladness that we are here. And so, God, today as we continue in this hour of worship, I ask on behalf of all of these friends of Jesus, these followers of Jesus, that you would fill them in a way that perhaps they've never been filled before, that you call them to come maybe one step or one mile or one millimeter closer, closer to knowing your love and grace. God, there are others in this world that need prayer. So many that we would never be able to name them all. But you know them, Lord. You know the ones that are hurting. You know the ones who are weak. You know those who have been marginalized. You know the ones who are in sin that need redemption. Lord, we have friends that will have surgery this week. And we have those who are still recovering from past surgeries. A Lord, across our state, across our nation, and across our world, we can see the darkness that has settled into nooks and crannies. Especially, Lord, our hearts and minds uh, are very cognizant of those who feel very lost and are really feeling the pressure and the power of a, of a country that is trying to strip them of what they know of home. So, Lord, for our brothers and sisters of the Ukraine, we ask your mercy. We ask your protection. We ask, Lord, that you would be with every man, woman, and child that is trying to right this wrong or simply just get through it. And, God, for those who are in Russia who never asked for this, those that are just caught up in this whirlwind of darkness, Lord, we ask your protection for them as well. For we know that there are children and women and fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers, Lord, that don't want war, that only strive for peace. God, on this day, as we look to the story of Nicodemus, let us be open to what you would want us to know for our own lives. Bless us, Lord, uh, when we come to your scriptures this day. 
And now with voices united, with hearts that are together because we love you, we offer to you now that prayer that your son taught his disciples of which we are a part of, the Lord's Prayer. So now receive that from us, Lord, we ask. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. What a gift. What a gift. So um, I know we have prayed, but um, if you will bow with me, uh, I want to pray one more time that my voice holds uh, for this message and, and for God to, to just come through loud and clear. So if you will pray with me and for me, I would appreciate it. Lord, as we begin <clears throat> to look at your scripture, to look at your word, Lord, I just ask that you would just wrap your hands, wrap your healing, wrap your uh, sustenance around my words, around my vocal cords, Lord. And I just ask that you would um, empower me to speak and empower all of us to listen. Lord, may your message, may your hope, may your good news come shining through. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So you see that slide that it came up. That's the name of our Lenten series, Encounters with Jesus. Encounters with Jesus. So when we think about an encounter, what do you think of? What do you think of when you think about that word encounter? To encounter is to come in contact with something or someone, and it's usually unexpected. Not always, but it's usually unexpected. And encounters can be difficult. They can be difficult, you know, meeting uh, with something or someone, but they can also be very rich and rewarding experiences. For the, these next today and then the next four Sundays after, we are going to look at different accounts of how Jesus encountered people in the New Testament, in the scriptures, in the Gospels. And so uh, we know that these people uh, were blessed by Jesus. Uh, they had uh, profound changes in their life because of Jesus. They came to know God when they came to know Jesus. And they're just very powerful ex ex experiences of these encounters that we have. So I'm really excited about digging in today for the first time. And today we are going to look at Nicodemus. Nicodemus. So Nicodemus is a Jew. He is a Pharisee. And he is a member of what's called the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin. So the Sanhedrin was one of the most important bodies um, in the Jerusalem world, in the religious world, really. The Sanhedrin was a council, if you want to say it that way. It was made up of 70 men. It had a high priest. It did a lot of the work of ordering the lives of people um, that absolutely connected with the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. And so these Pharisees and priests and Sadducees and scribes, these different people uh, who made up not just the Sanhedrin, but all of, of this Jewish life together really devoted themselves to the Torah. And the Torah, again, is the first five books of what we call our Old Testament. I like to say the Hebrew scriptures um, to give them a little more honor because they are our book too. Um, but... The Pharisees especially, they were committed to really living a pious, very um, law-driven life. And, and that's something that we don't fault them for. Uh, there are 613 laws in the Torah that God spoke saying you will do this and you won't do that. And so Pharise a, a Pharisaical life was one in which you strove and strove and diligently tried to attain um, actually following each and every one of these laws. So the, the problem with the Pharisees um, was that they started becoming self-righteous about it. They lost, I'm not going to say all of them because I wasn't back then living, but a lot of the stories when we see Jesus kind of fussing, like you brood of vipers, he's talking to the Pharisees. And so there's something about their attitude, something about their heart condition uh, that makes them feel this self-righteous, puffed up, um, I'm in, you're out, you know, and I'm doing good and you're not doing good. And so uh, we see this again by Jesus' own interaction with the Pharisees, we see that that is happening. Now, while Nicodemus was part of this body, right, he's part of this pharisaical life, there is something different about him. 
There's something very different about this particular Pharisee. His heart ached to know more of God or know a different depth of God. Um, and he ended up coming to Jesus uh, not during the day, but at night. And some of you are familiar with that story. So now let's look at the Gospel of John, where this is located. And John's Gospel is the only place where you find this encounter of Jesus and Nicodemus. You know, when you think about that, it's like had John not included this in his particular uh, Gospel writing, um, we would never know this story. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> okay, pray. <laughs> I think I'm good. I think I'm good. Okay, so John 3, 1 through 21. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. And so it is with everyone who is born from the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel? Right? He's pointing to him being a Pharisee. Are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe it if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God." This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, can you imagine <clears throat> being a, just, just you, just a, just a kind of single solo person sitting maybe across, from, uh, from, uh, across a table from or on a bench next to Jesus the Lord? And he speaks John 3, 16 and 17 to you personally. And granted, it's meant for the world. But this is, this is where Nicodemus is. Just in your mind, think about that. They are having this conversation and these are the words that our Lord speaks to him. 
It, it's, it's just unbelievable when I, when I really stop and think about that picture of what that might have looked like. And the only glimpse I have of it is from The Chosen because they do a great, great scene of Jesus and Nicodemus. If you've never seen it, watch it because it's, it, it'll make you cry. It's fabulous. But the scriptures tell us that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. And that perhaps is as significant as anything else in this passage of scripture. He can't go to Jesus during the light of day. He cannot be seen there. What would his, his religious brothers think about him if he did that? His Pharisee, Sadducee, Sanhedrin, you know, scribe uh, counterparts, how would they see that and look upon him in that light if he went to Jesus in the light of day? For what we read from the New Testament, they would not be happy. They would not be happy. And what do you think the whole Jewish community would do if they saw one of this man, uh, this man who was a leader of their community going to this person, Jesus, who they will eventually, right, put to death. They would not be happy about it. This is difficult for Nicodemus to do, and it perhaps is even dangerous for him to go to Jesus. But he takes this risk. And even though it might not be a big risk because it's at night, it is a risk Nonetheless, that he has got to make his way to talk to this man, to talk to this rabbi that he calls rabbi, teacher, uh, we hear in the scripture. So he does it, though, uh, being very cautious and using discretion. Now, we can envision Nicodemus, or I can, we can envision him feeling his way through the darkness of those Jerusalem streets. Can't you just kind of see him kind of, you know, going from building to building, kind of hiding in the shadows, making his way, way to the place that Jesus is staying? But here's the thing. <clears throat> More than the darkness, the physical darkness that's surrounding him, he's also groping with a darkness within him. He is, he is really struggling with seeing what he sees with his eyes, with, with hearing what he's hearing about Jesus, to actually being someone who thinks you could not do all these things if you were not actually from God. But yet he struggles uh, to really take that into himself to the point of saying, I'm with him. I'm with him. He has this darkness that he is struggling with in his own heart and his mind with his soul, right? And so he comes to Jesus at night, I think partly to unearth something new that will help him maybe make the decision. Either let's follow this, this man or uh, that's it. Now I know that I'm just going to continue living with my other brothers and sisters of the faith, living into this law that's bound up in the Torah. Nicodemus believes that this simple man from Nazareth is going to perhaps unlock something within him to help him decide. And so let's stop there for a second and, and think about, isn't that the beginning point of faith? Isn't that for many of us the beginning point of faith where we find ourselves that what we're doing, what we have tried, the things that we have uh, run to, gone to, whether that's religious life in some kind of way that really isn't the good news or whether it's something else that we come to that place that we're like, this what I'm trying to do, it's not doing it anymore. I need an unearthing that can help me live the kind of life that God has for me to live. And we see that Nicodemus is getting close to that point. And for him specifically... In all of his religious activity, with all of his trying to do good and be good and follow all these laws, what he finds is that there's still an empty ache within his soul. And I believe, I believe that he, even though, it, again, it's at night and it's not in the light of day, I believe that he knows that Jesus is the answer to that emptiness within him. So Nicodemus begins the conversation by acknowledging that Jesus has come from God, right? 
And Jesus replies, very truly I tell you, whenever we read that in scripture, you can just replace the words, listen up y'all, because that's what Jesus is saying. Whenever you see very truly I tell you, it like we need to stop and really listen and take in what Jesus is telling us. So he says, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And with that, Nicodemus comments about, you know, I don't understand. Like, I don't understand. How, how do I, you know, a grown man or any grown person go back into their mother's womb and be born again? He is misunderstanding like I think most of us would probably do. And, and one thing I want you to notice in this, and we find this so often in the gospel accounts, Jesus doesn't shake his finger at him. Jesus doesn't say, you know what? You're not going to get it. Like, you know, go back home. Uh, Jesus doesn't fuss. Jesus doesn't scream. Jesus doesn't belittle. He actually opens up the conversation wider. He invites and allows Nicodemus to keep wondering, keep struggling, keep asking, keep wanting to know. And Jesus continues to meet him in that place. And I think that is beautiful about this scripture. The Lord always welcomes that from each of us and every person who seeks for deeper faith. Jesus is that person. But he answers Nicodemus a second time, very truly I tell you, Listen up, y'all, is what he's saying. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, some commentaries will say that this particular, uh, these words of Jesus, very truly I tell you, you must be born of water. Um, a lot of people will say he's meaning baptism. I don't, I don't think that's what he's meaning. There's other commentaries that say, no, he was not meaning that. He was meaning a physical birth. And the reason why I believe that he, it, what he means is a physical birth, because the next thing he says is, what is born of flesh is flesh. That he's meaning, you must be born that way, yes. You must be born in a very physical way, yes. But then he continues, being born of the spirit along with being born of of the flesh, right? Uh, to be born of the spirit means that you, you're leaving the dark place in your life behind. That you're allowing God to work with you and in you and by you and in spite of you it, and for us as Christians in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what it is to be born again from the spirit. It's not a special, you know, litany that we, that we pray. It's not a special checklist that we have to do. It's really opening ourselves up and saying, God, have your way with me in Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus is offering to Nicodemus in this story. But here's another question I have about the text. Nicodemus is a religious man, devoutly religious. And I mean that in the best way, devoutly religious. He is a leader for the community of the Jewish people. Um, he has no doubt, I ha we're not told, but... No doubt he has come up in this faith from a very young age. He knows the Torah, the scriptures. Um, you know, he knows what to do. He has been attempting to live into all those laws for all the many years that he's been alive. And again, we don't know how many those are either. The scriptures don't tell us. So what is the darkness that Jesus wants him to step out of? What, what, is, the, what is the darkness that he is inviting Nicodemus to leave behind. Well, first, Nicodemus is being held in a prison by his own accord. He's being held in this dark, kind of shadowy place by his own lack of understanding that this man, Jesus, is truly the Son of God. And if he would put himself in those hands, he would absolutely never uh, experience that darkness again. That's part of his darkness. So coming to Jesus, he's cracking open that door a little bit and allowing a little bit of the light of Jesus to come in. But he's too afraid to let that totally happen. He's got fear within him. And so some of the fear that I thought about is the fear of abandonment that he might experience from 
uh, the, the hierarchy, the Sanhedrin and all of his counterparts. He might experience abandonment by everyone who calls themselves a Jew, and he probably would. would. He's fearful of that. He's fearful of maybe losing his place in that life because it's everything that he has ever known. And of course, I mean, I say to myself, yeah, I get it, right? He's afraid of that. He might be afraid, like I said before, of losing his physical life, which is what keeps him in the shadows. But Nicodemus, Nicodemus is spiritually curious. He's got a lot of questions in his heart and in his mind that he, want, would, that he wants to talk through with Jesus. And I see Nicodemus as coming to Jesus with these very uh, childlike qualities. The, these questions of, you know how little kids are like, why this and why that? And I don't understand. Tell me more. This is Nicodemus. He's allowing that little touch of light to reflect upon his life. But he's not yet prepared to come into the full light. It, the scriptures don't tell us what happens after this encounter. And really, these 21 verses in this third chapter, um, that is the whole story of this particular encounter. We just don't know. But we're left with thinking that he probably didn't, that he remains a bit um, distanced from Jesus. And again, maybe this is because of the chosen that I've watched, but there's just one powerful scene that he's standing, you know, kind of at the corner of a building and Jesus is there with the disciples and they're getting ready because the next, the next verse after 21, 22, it says that they went on. So they went on to like another town, another city. And in and, and the chosen, we see Nicodemus just standing and he's kind of looking, whatever. And when they start walking away, he breaks down and sobs. So he knows, he knows, but that fear has the best of him. The fear has the best of him. So we can look at Nicodemus and say, oh, poor Nicodemus. Jesus was right there in front of you. You had the Son of God right there in front of you. How in the world did you not believe? How is that possible? But here's the thing, we, we don't need to do that with this text, right? What we need to do is put ourselves in the text. And that's what I say. If we cannot go to the scriptures and apply what we learn, then really we are missing just a boatload of grace for our lives. And so the question that I have for you, and I ask myself this too, is uh, what are places that you are still living in the shadows, what are places in your, life, in your life where God is calling you to come out fully into the light and leave those shadow places, that darkness behind? And for each one of us, that looks really, really different. Those dark places look, it could be sin. You know, we read in, in the scriptures, darkness equates sin, yes. But that darkness is also fear, and I guess that could be sin as well. But where might that be in your life and in my life? Where might that be? What are you afraid of? And what does a movement into maybe a fuller lit life with Jesus, what maybe could that mean for you? And what maybe would you have to give up in order to do that? Are you afraid of that? Are you afraid of that? Maybe you're afraid because other people will ridicule you for being a holy roller or for being a seeking, searching, active disciple of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're afraid of that. That is that's a human fear that a lot of us have. Maybe you are fearful because you're like, if I make this step, then a lot of what I was ever taught and whatever I have ever known, it's going to change that. And that's scary to me. How will my family think about that? How do I feel about that? To let go maybe of wrong narratives or wrong ways of understanding a life of faith and understanding a, a grace-filled Savior, that can be scary to some people. I may have to let that go. And no doubt Nicodemus was experiencing those same feelings, those same feelings. Or maybe you know that, you know what, if I let this go 
And if I am in the shadows here and take a step, even one step into the light, that's going to call for change in my life. And I don't know that I can do it. And I don't know that I want to do it. Again, I think that's based on a lot of fear. So what might be reasons that we don't come fully into living the life that Jesus describes here? And it's the John 3, 16, 17. That it's this eternal life that doesn't start when we die, but starts the, the very moment that you're like, yes, Lord, um, here I am. And you keep living into that more and more as you leave the darkness behind and step out into the light. I hope and pray that we, we think about that, that we ponder that. And here's the thing, we don't ponder that to beat ourselves up. We don't think about, gosh, yes, you're right. This is an area that it's like if I do this, this is going to mean this and that and the other or whatever the reasons are. You know, we need to ponder those, but we don't need to get bogged down in those because that's not Jesus' intention. That's not the work that he wants to do. He wants to release us from the darkness and have us live into the light. So during Lent, ponder what that might be for you. You might be sitting there this morning going, I know exactly where that is. Ponder that. Pray about that. Lift that to the Lord. And let the Lord help you deal with such an experience. So I believe that uh, what Jesus is trying to get across to Nicodemus is that very thing. Is basically, if you just put your life in my hands, don't worry about the Sanhedrin. Don't worry about all the people that are going to shake their fingers uh, at you. Don't worry about losing your place as one of the high people that sit on this council. Don't worry about that. Just come with me and experience life in its fullness. That is the invitation um, that he is making to Nicodemus. And I believe that's the invitation that he makes for each one of us. And so what happened to Nicodemus? Whatever happened to him? There's so many unfinished stories, encounters, or parables that Jesus tells that we, we never have like an ending. Like I always want to, and they lived happily ever after, right? Prodigal son, what does the older brother do? Does he go into the party and party and celebrate or does he stay outside on the porch sulking? Don't know that. And this story of Nicodemus, we don't know that either. We don't know if this dark night was uh, converted into a full life lived in the light, at least not in the ensuing maybe weeks, perhaps even months. Again, we can only guess about that. But we can know, and we do know, that at the end, at the end of Jesus' life, Nicodemus was a different person. So in chapter 19 of John's gospel, we read these words. After Jesus breathed his last, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a secret disciple of Jesus because of his fear from the Jews, another person that's afraid, he asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing an exorbitant amount of myrrh and aloes. They took the body of Jesus, anointed it with these spices, and wrapped it in linen cloths. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. The men placed Jesus' body there. At some point, at some point, Nicodemus said, no more. No more living in the darkness. No more hiding. No more pretending. No more worrying about what others think. I am going to do exactly what Jesus invited me to do and live in the full light of day. 
You don't do this kind of work unless you are committed to the person in which you anoint their body and wrap it for burial so beautifully, so tenderly, and lay it in this tomb. You don't do that unless that person has profoundly changed your life. And so we celebrate today that at some point, Nicodemus said yes, a big old yes. Yes to Christ, yes to light, yes to his eternity starting now, yes to everything that Jesus has been offering to him. And I pray, I pray that our lives will find themselves sooner rather than later giving that big old yes to God too. Amen and amen. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Gracious Lord, you know that in many of our hearts, if not all of them, that there are times when everything in us wants to say yes to you in every way, in every place, in every situation, in every circumstance. We want to want to step out into the light. We want to want to step out of the darkness. But Lord, so often we are afraid. We wonder, will you catch us when, when we're out into the light? Will you have our backs? Will you continue to lead us and guide us? Is this life, this eternal life that you promise us, is it true? Is it real? Is it there for me? Lord, help us to know with every fiber of our being that as we give you that big old yes, you shout back to us in great glory and celebration, yes, yes, yes. Lord, may it be that we be people of full light who come into the light and who radiate that light into the world because by this, Lord, by this, we will be at work helping you to build that kingdom that we want every person to know and every person to experience, that we want everyone to encounter in the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We ask this and we pray this in his most holy name. Amen and amen. So as we prepare to uh, go out into the world, I uh, just want to remind you that, again, uh, we, we, we have First Cup. I'm offering you a time to just sit over a cup of coffee and talk immediately after this service. So, again, just hang in here as I greet people and, and wish them a good morning, and then we'll go grab a cup of coffee. And if today's not a good time for you, anytime. Call me, text me, email me, whatever. Let me know that you want that time. And I, that is really the favorite thing that I do just about. Um, but I am always up for that conversation. So I hope that you you will indeed take advantage of that. So let us now stand and sing our closing hymn number 292, What Wondrous Love Is This? Cause the 
may we, as we sing on in this big, beautiful world, may we sing in full light so that millions will join us, join us in this beautiful, awesome, life-giving life that we have in Jesus Christ. Go forward in his love and in his grace, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen.